Uh, so tell me more about you guys first of all like I'll introduce you, yourself like you know like, what do you want to know with you guys <laughs> just give me whatever like you know, elevator, like because okay. you like I'll, I'll give you like okay i'll give you something um i went through your profiles obviously <laughs> um and i kind of like saw a little me in you guys mm. like and so i was very impressed by that and i was like okay i need to do this podcast because you guys seem like a lot like me you know well, so i, I, I think ahead. like what i recognize in you is you're kind of in the search for knowledge but in like loads of different areas as well and I think um, that's what intrigued me. And I think um, we quite, I think we focus around psychology, philosophy, also like science and well, anything really. But like, um, we, I, I find myself interested in like a lot of different topics and don't know really where to stop. And I think Joel's the same. Yeah. Great. So you guys are psychology and philosophy students, I suppose. Undergrad. Um, I, I'm actually a business student, but um. I, I mean, yeah, it, it it comes, you know, yeah. Same thing. yeah. yeah. Isn't, isn't, isn't everything sort of psychology and philosophy? Isn't that what life is? I mean, that's what life is to me. I feel like everything yeah. originates from that, right? Like, there you go. I mean, for, mathematics came from philosophy. What not? What did not come from philosophy, right? Like, mm. we had the theoretical bits and then we went to the experimental part. So, yeah. I mean, I feel like it's that way. I mean, it's yeah. a good question to like, um why you should introduce yourself to philosophy like do you want to study life do you want mm. you, you might, it's quite important i think to to at least like have an idea about some of these theories and it kind of it's like hyper true mm. Mm. no that is true i mean what's the use of knowledge if you can't apply it and use it in life and actually like use it to tweak the way you look at things right I, I find a lot of the things we study academically are just weird abstractions of the world that just aren't really that helpful like it's interesting at times but a lot of it is just you don't need it to function optimally as a human whereas i feel like psychology and philosophy discovering parts of that helps you just with life no matter what it is you do like it doesn't matter you can be a bin man or like working mcdonald's and you still can be developed by what you learn do you know what i mean mm. No, I get that. I get that completely. Like, I'm fascinated with, like, these days, Um, to be honest, like, I'll let you guys know what I'm doing these days. I'm reading a lot of um esoteric philosophy, so, like, hermetic philosophy, right? Like, this book right here. I'm revisiting it, technically. The Kabbalion. I'm not sure whether you guys heard of this one. But what is, um, what is her hermetic philosophy? Hermetic philosophy comes from this guy uh, called Hermes Trismegistus. It's a crazy name right <laughs> Hermes Trismegistus was this um I mean uh, we we think that we know him because like we don't know much of him because the Alexandria the library of Alexandria was burnt right so most of the most of the books most, most of the knowledge was gone but somehow I feel like there's this person who was able to procure just this amount of things that was left and and it's it's crazy because it's like a it's like a book that kind of lays out the structure of the laws of physics right like so what is cause and effect what is rhythm what is correspondence what is the um aspect of mentalism things like that and i was just moved away so i started revisiting this and then a bit of like um film so i've been watching a lot of films and like trying to like philosophize or psychologize them, like psychoanalyze them. That's something that I do love, absolutely love doing, right? I feel like art, if anything, art just stands out and art just shows you the way in the sense that it shows you, oh, these, this is life. And we have got all of these different degrees that you can tap in, in this life. And via art or via film, we're able to kind of like let people intuitively or instinctively or visually or you know why a sound just kind of absorb the holistic picture of it mm. and it's beautiful it's beautiful to like you know like i was watching that horror film uh, again uh, by ari esther hereditary not sure whether you guys yeah it's a, it's a, like a really famous 2018 film that came out it's a horror cult film and I was just very moved away by, I watched like a four hour <laughs> video decoding everything about that film, right? So from color schemes to how the music was putting effect in it, how the set was designed, just like every single, single, single element. And it just like, you know, made me think about life, like, because I tend to think of everything in degrees, right? Like everything has scales, everything has degrees. 
like everything, even human emotions, like, you know, it's like a rainbow almost. Like you got like a 180 degree, like tap into every single frequency, higher dimension, whatever you want to, you know, keyword it as, right? Um, it's interesting. So that is another thing. And I guess black holes is very, very interesting. So, you know, I'm a very multidisciplinary person in that way. But I guess I started out like you guys only like I, I remember like walking into my undergraduate philosophy class, right? And this philosophy, philosophy teachers doing his thing, you know, he's, he's teaching the course, but um, I'm lost in my own, like he said something and I got lost in it. And then that's how I started like this whole journey. So it's interesting. Yeah. So this is like somewhat what I'm tapping into. What about you guys? What about you guys? I'm interested. <laughs> go on, Jacob, you go, go first. No, no, you okay. go. Yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> um, uh, just on your film point, I think it's um a lot of people don't understand like the codes of conventions and the meaning that gets put into all the elements. It's like everything is thought out strategically and that kind of surprised me when i when i first understood it is like um why is there a low angle right now well because the low angle makes the person seem how pow more powerful um maybe unconsciously to the viewer um i thought that was quite we'll probably get back to black holes because i thought that was quite interesting but um i i'm just hyper curious um i i want to know everything and I've only been on kind of like the search for wisdom for maybe uh, just over a year and a half. And we've only been doing this podcast for um, just under a year. Um, and I find it, it gives a lot of meaning and um, kind of fell in love with knowledge. Um, my main areas that I like are... Uh, philosophy right now i'm reading a lot of nisha um and um i think a lot of joel's psychology has rubbed off on me and i now find myself in a costa analyzing why they've done certain why they've put like the picture why they've chose a picture on the warm white place there rather than somewhere else um but also like i like to sort of think about analyzing people and their and, and why they do their actions um yeah i i'm in very inter interested in art and creativity right now um that's a big main focus i've got a clothing brand and i've had to like um i've kind of put everything into targeting artists and trying under trying to explore uh what it is that makes um a creative a creative and how they can create something that resonates with so many people um and i'm i i i've wanted to be an entrepreneur for, for quite a while um and, and so, so kind of the start of um my, my journey was was business um but i find myself exploring into different things now and um, i just want to keep going and um i'm, I'm excited for the journey um <laughs> yeah that's, you know, that's, that was, okay that's very great yeah joel go on. i was just gonna say it's so nice to actually like um you know, even though I, I i know jacob very well it's nice to hear him like have to articulate like who are you type of thing um but yeah, yeah anyway me so uh i am an athlete um but not just in the physical sense in the mental sense in the spiritual and philosoph philosophical sense that's how i see it anyway so um I play a sport. Um, I play wheelchair basketball um, and uh, play to a high level. So basically after my degree, I want to go and play professionally um, in Europe. Um, so that's a lot of my time is spent training. Um, and I apply my principles that I get from sport to the mental life of trying to learn and acquire knowledge, but also in the philosophical life of trying to improve the way I think about the world. So my general approach to things is how can I how can I learn and discover things and adapt to things so that my performance, not just in the outside world and how I play on the court or how I interact with people, but also in the mental world, like how is how's the texture of my mind? How are my emotions? Um, how are my belief systems? And are they set up appropriately for me to feel the best and act the best for not my not just myself, but also other people? So yeah, that's me.
I'd say. I feel like you guys are very self-aware in that way. That's that's amazing because okay, um, like uh, one thing about sports because I feel like even Jacob, if I feel like even you play some sort of a sport, right? Because that's I used, what I saw. Yeah. I, so I, I go gym, um, but I used to play basketball. I played for like six years. Yeah, so it's 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 amazing. I feel like I respect you guys more because it's like you have like a physical discipline and you can translate that mentally. And like this is something that I feel like Joe Rogan talks about a lot. You know, like the, you know, going to gym and like you know how having that like discipline in life, you can you can easily translate. I feel like m like mental concepts into reality and vice versa, right? Like it's 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 a different transcendental state in itself. I feel so. Strong. It's amazing. Strong. I mean. I I need some physical exercise in real life right now. Um, but that's that's amazing. Like that's really, really amazing. Um, so uh, tell me, okay, let's start with uh let's start with okay, so you said you wanna uh play professionally wheelchair basketball, right? Yeah. That sounds like walk me through, okay, walk me through your like how do you okay, because I'm very interested in knowing this, like like being a player and having that kind of discipline and you read a lot of philosophy and psychology right so is there any are there any like psychological concepts or like philosophical theories or whatever you know like concepts theories structures whatever that mm. you feel like you can translate somehow via the very motion of the of the of the sport that you're playing like it's it's a very transcendental question in itself but like let's like let's start to like theorize things and see where we go no that is a that's a fantastic question and i also just want to say right the best podcast episode is when we get a guest on and they start asking us questions right i just want to say that now because sometimes we have people come on right and they just sort of expect us to interview them and it's quite stagnant where if you just come on you want us to introduce ourselves you're opening up and this is brilliant so i'm enjoying the vibe so far but anyway um oh, that's, a, that's a fantastic question i think a big one is um when I was younger in the sport, I was taught to be very wary of having a big ego um, because I'd been around players my age that had a big ego and sort of would dominate other people in that way. Um, and being on the other side of that as the smaller person um, or with, the, you know, with less narcissism per se, like I, that wasn't an enjoyable experience. So I grew up in the sport being afraid of that being afraid of becoming that grandiose person that no one really likes. Um, but then I realized that there's a difference between that level of narcissism and a level of self-confidence that you need to have. Um, but I think firstly, the line between those two isn't obvious whatsoever. And secondly, people think the line is in different places depending on who they are. Right. So you have to find where the line is for you. But I've, I've, what I've considered over the past few months is that, the line between self-confidence and ego is when you believe there is no more work to be done. So you have to have this confidence that you can go out and perform, that like you have to visualize the player that you want to be and then become that, right? Because if you don't have the thought in your mind, it doesn't happen in the world. But you can never accept the fact or never start to believe the fact that you've done everything you need to do. Right? You always need to believe there's more work to be done. So that's been something that's been big over the last year for me. It's like, how can I... How can I believe that um, I'm worthy and good enough that when I go and, and play, I'll play to a good standard without inflating that too much? Um, so that's that's an interesting one. Um, also, I would say having a big, big internal locus of control. That's a huge one. Um, so being the captain of my vessel in my life, right? Believing that I'm driving my own destiny. And that has allowed me to um take accountability for things and focus on doing things that other people won't do because at the end of the day whether it's in sport or in work or in 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 music or or whatever it is you want to do right like the only way you get ahead of other people is by doing the things they don't want to do so if i can have the the mindset that it's all on my shoulders and i just have to wake up each morning and do the grunt work that other people don't want to do um then then I'll eventually over time that will accumulate and, and build up um and I'll get ahead. But you know, that's that that's two key ones, but I could go on to more, but I don't want to waffle too much. 
no, but I feel like you tapped into like interesting things. I'm gonna be taking notes also. <laughs> <laughs> but like, okay, okay, because that's how I remember most of, most of the things as they're really just happening in present time. So you you said something about like um a balance between narcissism and self control or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like you're tapping into something that everyone needs to be because everyone is so distinct, everyone is so diverse, and like you know we we it's like eight billion people on this planet, and everyone is you know everyone is just point zero zero one person, like everyone is on some other frequency. I feel so. This is what I was trying to like convey with with the whole thing that I see things as degrees and scales, you know, like most of the things like most of the physical things that we can explain or mental things that we try to I guess intuitively or why a certain mental structure that we form to try to understand that and um, homeostasis right like the concept of balance or the concept of balancing two things perfectly or multiple things in certain degrees perfectly I feel like that like any athlete any even student like if to have discipline I feel you need to, or to have like a sense of complete whole self, you need to have like a homeostatic, psychosomatic state, right? So body, mind, balance in every shape or form, like, you know, and and the concept of homeostasis, it's, it's amazing because like if you have a homeostatic, psychosomatic state, right? Um, you can be achieving most things in life and you can go to bed, right? Like you talked about going to bed and, I don't have any work to do, like having that kind of mindset also taps into something that being present, right? Like um, I was, I was watching this because like nowadays we have like the 30 second reel addiction thing. Sometimes like you go on and then you scroll and there was this one reel that was um, talking about like how, what, what is that thing called? It has like um, sand in it and it goes from one side to the other. Just time. Uh, the time. Some time. Exactly. Yeah. So Exactly. So in between when you see and, and like when it's going all the way down, like slowly, all the present is between of it, right? The present is this, this, this part, right? Mm -hmm. um, and all we truly know, really, at the end of the day is this moment right now. Like if you take a telescope and zoom into Jupiter or Saturn, or even let's say if you have a very good telescope, you can see Andromeda galaxy or whatever, right? You're seeing their past, you're not saying they're right now. You're seeing their past. This is, I feel like, one of the reasons why alien civilization, even if they exist, probably hasn't contacted us. Because think about it, right? If they do have a telescope and they're looking at Earth, probably Roman Empire is going on right now, right? Because time is such like a relative thing in space time, and like it's it's crazy when you think about it. Like is that, that because the light that um that, that way when we look up, it doesn't like the speed of light is slower. Mm, okay, we can also look this up. I feel like the speed of light is stronger. I feel like with the way time works is that the the way we travel, like it's it's, it's interesting. I feel like okay, well, wait, let me I, try to like look at I, from a reductionist perspective. The yeah, way I understand ahead. it is that um mm -hmm. speed of light is a set speed, right? Um, so when you see the stars in our sky, you're seeing a light that has traveled from light years away. So you've heard the term light year, Jacob. Right. A light year is how far light travels in a year. OK. And light is rapid, mate. I don't I don't have the number like open to mind, but it's, it's a ridiculously quick speed. Right. So imagine how far that would travel in a whole year. Right? They actually set that as a distance. Right. So the, the stars that we see in our sky or we can see maybe could be so, so far away that we're seeing light that they emitted years ago. So the starlight that you see tonight will, will be a star that burned maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago. But it's taken 20 years for that light to travel through space to then like be detected by your eyes, if that makes sense. Uh... Yeah, so so what, what she's arguing, which is great, is that like if aliens did exist and they had this crazy telescope and they could see Earth, the light projecting from Earth might be light from a thousand years ago. Um, and won't be so showing the present why, day. That, that could be why that we don't know aliens exist then, because it's it's a representation of that planet from t like from too many years ago where there wasn't life. And yeah, yeah, and basically for them to get here, they would have to figure out a way to travel faster than the speed of light, which would need some ridiculous technology that we can't even comprehend.
because we've said that there's aliens on Mars. Oh no, that there's like Who's there's we? bacteria. You? Mars, sorry. Okay. Um, no, I, I I think it's a fact that there's bacteria on Mars, but like that might just be people looking at Mars and seeing there's bacteria. But when they actually go there, they're like, oh shit, there's an alien. <laughs> I, don't that's, I don't know if that's really how it works, but yeah, isn't isn't that from like the robots that went up there and like detected shit? I don't know. I don't really like research space or whatever, but yeah. But this is like what, what I was gonna say, like from a redu reductionist perspective, I guess Joel did a great job of like breaking it down, right? Like, so like we went from homeostasis to let's say present mind, and then something that you were saying before was that when you go to sleep, um, you wanna feel like you have because we live in present, we don't know what this is and what this is it's like just this that we know like what what's happening right now right so to be able to have that mindset that you're going to bed and thinking today is done you know i've done it at night you just go to sleep you turn your phone off and it's done that is amazing because like i was reading about like freud's uh i mean i feel like you guys are psychology students so you might know the death drive and the pleasure principle and you know the, those freudian concepts and so I feel like death drive, right? Like this existential dread, that kind of unconscious or subconscious mostly, um, that kind of attracts you towards being in being lazy or you know being in difficult situations because you just you have given up, you've given up control, right? So the whole thing about discipline is having control to get rid of that death drive right? that's constantly there in humans, right? Like that fear of death. Now you can escape it. There's meditation, there's even psychedelics that you can, you know, do and, and escape that fear, right? But uh, you want to make sure that that dead drive is eliminated to a certain, not completely, because I don't feel like you can, you know, just like completely eliminate, eliminate certain traits, certain virtues or certain values, you know, within different parameters in your life, whether it be um, your brain, your mind, you know, any any of that, like, or sections in, in life, you know, I feel like you need to get rid of the, not rid, but like minimize that death drive so you can have more control. And so now all of this ties up, right? Like homeostasis, being in the present, getting rid of the death drive. And that entire thing, what you just said makes you a complete person makes you a more functional self-aware person and i feel like the the bet it ha it's better that it happens at a younger um time in your life so like in your 20s something like that so you're able to because life is so anxiety driven like i was reading about um you know antinatalism this concept that uh if you're not born you're just you know you're it's better to be not be born because you escape the anxiety, which is life, right? And Schopenhauer talks about it. Arthur Schopenhauer being a German pessimist philosopher, uh, he talks about it a lot, like life is suffering, you know? And so to minimize that suffering or to minimize that anxiety, right? You want to have control. It's not like you're, uh, you know, like you're born and now you have like, okay, maybe not the very early childhood stages of um, zero to let's say even 13, let's just go all the way up to 13, right? Like after that, you're more active, you're even mentally functioning very well, you're asking questions, you're, you're technically an adolescent, right? I feel like at that point, you start to really see the anxieties in life, right? Like there's a lot of anxieties in life in all sorts of sectors in life, right? You wake up, you're like, uh, I just want to sleep right now. Like, I don't want to wake up and go on a run. And like, that's, that's a different kind of anxiety. Like anxiety, not as a, not as a psychological symptom, but just as an existential symptom, it's always there, right? Yeah, me and, and Jacob, so me and by... Jacob call that the demons in the mind. When you wake up <laughs> so in the morning. So you want to have control. Yeah. Exactly. So you want to have control, you want to have homeostatic psychosomatic state to avoid that anxiety as like a positive resistance symptom against that ang anxious existential symptom that's always there. So it's, it's interesting how that, you function. That, um, that anxiety theory that Schopenhauer said, is that like a group of people that kind of agree that it's better if you didn't exist than you did exist? I mean, I wouldn't say this anxiety thing is directly mentioned in Schopenhauer. It's something that I feel like 
I'm just introducing, but like you can you can try it. Like it's it's, a, it's like a Freudian Schopenhauerian thing in that way, right? Um, uh, Schopenhauer strictly talks about the um, ideals of the pessimistic structure to life, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. So pes pessimistic way of looking at life, but also not like complete pessimism, like not like oh antinatalism completely a bit away from that right so it's not like you know everything is just bad everything is suffering now what, why uh, would you be a pessimist like... sorry yeah why, why would you be a pessimist though Best, so this is what i was gonna like mention is like when you lose control in life or when you lose a certain type of discipline in life because life is like it's it's so many things and people try to define life as <laughs> it's like consciousness right like you take that term consciousness and everyone's like either it's awareness either it's sentience, or either it's just a state of being like you know there's just so many ways of looking at it right and so the same with life you know there's just way too many things there's optimism there's pessimism but what happens when you absolutely look at it from like one degree right so absolute optimism right or uh translate that into social um structure so utopian society that cannot exist good and bad or um utopia and dystopia right they both have to exist chaos and order as traits have to exist in order to us to be able to pinpoint oh that's good that's good because i know what's bad right like that's how you kind of know things and so it's it's interesting like um it's just very interesting to me like how life has all of these different degrees but somehow humans are just so like and not 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 just like i'm not saying that everyone is and i'm not but like even i'm like you know like uh stupid in that way that i don't sometimes like i would be talking about life and i only see this one degree i'm discussing but it is this and so this is what happens when you're like a multidisciplinary person um you look at it from all angles and so one of the things that I was thinking about is like, if we need a theory of everything, right? Like, which is like, if you're like, you guys are in the early stages, right? Like at one point, even you guys will be like, theory of everything is what I want to be working on for the rest of my life. You know, at least in, at, le at least at certain structure of your brain, you'd be like, okay, what is singularity? Where did everything begin? How is it going to end? Why do we exist? Like all of these fundamental questions that everyone ponders about, right? And so to tackle that question, um, physics uh, might be going via the root of super strength theory or loop quantum gravity or whatever the new uh, thing is to like get the quantum mechanics and like uh, gravity together, you know, uh, or you could look at it from philosophical angles. Okay, people are discussing consciousness, people are discussing all of these different like, there's a history of philosophy where you got all these philosophers tackling the same questions. And how do they tackle it? How do they differ, right? And psychology does it, okay. There's analytical psychology by Jung, right? Like there's complete Freudian psychology. And then you got even Lacan with the, I would say a semantic way of looking at psychology with language and linguistics, right? It's very interesting, very complex, very interesting. Um, and so you got like all of these different things. And I feel like if you take all these disciplines, right? Maybe maybe that's how we really get into the theory. Maybe that's how we really achieve theory of everything, right? Because that's essentially taking parameters of one discipline. Like there's a discipline and there's different parameters. And we're trying to tackle this problem from all possible parameters. And so we get like a holistic kind of like way of looking at things. And I feel like if you want to achieve a theory of everything, maybe the best way is not to be focused in, yeah, physics is trying to do it with SST or loop quantum gravity or whatever, but maybe they also need to look at like other things. I feel like you'll get like a complete, because it's like the observer observe thing. Like, you know, like I'm an observer, I'm looking at things. Like there's a perception theory also there. Like I'm trying to observe something. And physics is not, not the only thing I'm observing, right? Like, you know how Einstein was like, uh, like this, right? So the pen went like that, right? So our universe has space-time curvature, right? That's how we intuitively got to it, by the way. How crazy is that? That he was just like this, and he was like, ah, oh, why is it going like this, right? Like, why did it not like go like that? Like, why is it going like, because space-time is curved. <laughs> so like, imagine like we intuitively 
via Descartes uh, scientific reasoning or whatever you want to call it, we reach to our conclusions, right? And we make up our minds. It's very interesting. And so theory of everything, if you just like try to only understand the observed universe, maybe you don't get the whole picture because we are also very subjective beings. And what we really are experiencing, I'm not saying observing, experiencing, experience also would contain the observation part, is a mixture of the subjective and the objective. And so you need the hard sciences and you need the social or the humanitarian sciences together to get a theory of everything. Hmm. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I like this. I like this. It's good rambling. Um, I want to go back to you talking about how homeostasis is not just a physical thing, that you can have homeostasis of the mind. That's what I wrote down here. That's what kind of, um, popped out to me is significant um, and then you link that to how you find that homeostasis of the mind through having a sense of control and the way you have control is through being disciplined in life right across all things physically mentally emotionally spiritually um, and I think which I think you touched on a little bit but I want to dig a bit more deeper into is how to get that control you need to actually be aware that you need it or aware of a way to get towards it right because I was thinking about this the other day when I was driving. Um, I was thinking about how I think the main thing that separates people across all areas of life is self-awareness. Is do you are you are you reflexively aware of your own mind and your own actions and how those things like how those causes lead to effects in your life? Um and how I mean and, and knowing the kind of path you're on now in the plethora of paths you could take through life and then where that path will lead you and whether you want to jump to a different path and what that different path looks like and how to actually get there. Um, so firstly, do you agree with me on that? Um, and then secondly, why do you think you've gathered this level of self-awareness? And like, I want to know a little, a little bit about your personal story because obviously when you were born and up to the age of whatever, you weren't thinking or talking about these kind of things. So yeah, talk to me about that and how you know your journey in in self discovery, as I say, to use a sort of cringy term, but I like it. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so this this whole term, right, homeostatic psychosomaticism. I came up with this term like I did not come with homeostasis and psychosom, but I like together combined. I came up with that. Like I came up with that to kind of like yeah, you're right to kind of intellectualize self-awareness as a concept as a structure right to yeah maybe gain discipline at a, at a very broader level so how did I come to this kind of self-awareness uh-huh it was really to be very honest I feel like when I started reading Jung Carl Jung a lot that I really started to become self-aware if I'm being very honest like um I got interested in philosophy and psychology because of my friends mainly right my friends were um because I was in an international program, undergraduate program, so everyone was from everywhere. Someone's from France, someone's from Spain. You know, it was crazy. But um, my friends were very much into uh, the German philosophy and also, you know, certain French psychoanalysts, let's say, right? And so they would talk about that a lot. And so obviously when you have that in your surrounding, you just com feel compelled to Google things and to learn about it more. And so that's how I really started to like, okay, what is for, like, really, like, obviously, we were learning all that in our coursework, but I just felt compelled to go deeper, right? Uh, to not just just read the uh, assigned readings, but like, to really go into them. And so that's how we really started. And then Jung, I feel like really started making me think about myself and my actions, right? So when he talks about this collective unconscious concept that um, history and social structures and certain historical and um, let's just say historical archetypes are embedded in our embedded in the deepest substrate of our psyche right and how they sometimes become conscious in in simplistic ways in your life so I was reading something like that about in, in I guess volume nine if I'm not mistaken by Jung uh, there's two parts to volume nine the best I guess volume out of all the uh, 18 volumes that's there uh, that really taps into this kind of stuff. Um, when I started reading that, I was I was like compelled to look at like m my surroundings first, right? So I'm like looking at 
oh, I'm, I'm I'm sitting in a bus and I'm listening to music and I'm looking out the window and I'm just trying to be really present but also aware right so it's not like being aware of first you need to start you know like like Descartes said like you need to start with a pen and paper to spell all your preconceived notions and build everything from there so the same thing right you could be in any situation what you want to be do, doing is try to be in a meditative state without closing your eyes like you need to make sure that your senses are self-aware right to a certain extent and so being in bus right like music and looking at the external immediate environment and how do I how does my senses particularly interact even though I'm not partaking in any action like I'm just sitting in a stationary position there's a relative um, you know I'm, I'm traveling traveling relatively because the bus is moving and the immediate external environment is stationary right so there's relative relativity there in, in between that space and I'm just trying to observe first so it's a form of meditation really at the end of the day and just by doing that I started noticing things around me right like um, one of the beautiful things that happened with psychedelics particularly was that they made me notice the things that are always there but you don't pay attention to right um, and it's it's amazing it's a really good tool honestly uh, to to make you aware of that to a certain extent and so just taking from what you know my friend like my surroundings so what what's being talked about that obviously had a major influence then me reading Jung at a certain extent then me trying psychedelics then me trying to just take everything and like write it down and sum it up and okay like you know what is what am I what have I gotten myself into you know am I going to be that philosopher who's going to be like having the specs and like the tobacco pipe and like be writing at the end of the at the end of the time or whatever. But um, that's really how I feel like one by one, I got into this outer aspect of self-awareness, right? Like I would I would put it that way. Then this uh, internal aspect of self-awareness, which is purely psychological. So internal in the sense it's purely mental, like things about yourself, right? My ego, uh, how I talk to people, how people respond to me, like, you know, but usually concentrated around me you know, my behavior, you know, and, and, and psychology really helps in that. And I guess psychopathology, if you study that, like, you know, how there's uh, certain types of mental disorders and, and because with pathology, you try to like sometimes understand the sanity of it all, right? And so, because even sanity is kind of insanity, like if you really think about it. Uh, and so to incorporate like different elements from here and there, and then becoming self-aware. And one of the other things the psychedelics also did to me was the ego aspect. And Jung, actually, and Jung, when you know, and 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 I guess the the triad of psychology. So Freud being on the top here, um, Jung being here as a analytical or mystical mystical psychology, right? And then Lacan being here having a semantic or a linguistic substrate to it. And so all of it just becomes like a triad. It's a triad of psychoanalysis, having that kind of reflective mechanism to think about you and the external immediate environment and then whatever noise is there you try to like observe things so maybe having a certain uh perceptual way of tapping into what is the scientific method so both this outer this this observable thing and this internal self-reflective thing combined that's homeostatic psychosomaticism right you reach that level you you just you're outside like this this me interacting with this air right now this empty space because we're all actually 70 to 90 percent just empty space you know like it's crazy so uh me interacting like this but me also thinking me doing this okay what what kind of crazy thing i'm doing right? like having that self-reflecting thought so that's what being self-aware is and and this ego thing that you were talking about before that's also very interesting because as I mentioned earlier, psychedelics did help with that too. Um, but also, I guess, Jung, when he talks, and, and, and Freud and Lacan, with the whole thing about super ego, ego, you know, like the basic psychology. Uh, and and when, you, when you read that, but when you really grasp it, and when you really try to look at it, look at yourself from that angle. And then when psychedelics completely dispel that at a certain point, you don't have an ego experiencing that, right? And then coming back from it, taking everything that you know, 
you just become self-aware. I feel so. I feel like you, but you need to have that drive within you. You need to have, you need to be willing to be able to look yourself in the mirror when you're on a psychedelic. That's, you know, that's a scary thing to do because it's like, oh, this is me, you know? And and now this is me without an ego. So who am I, you right? Like the Sanskrit term, nan yar, question mark comes, who am I, right? You know, and then the whole, when the whole, it's it's such a weird thing to explain also because it's like such a subtle yet hypnotic state to be in to have not to have no ego at all and a scary thing at first it's scary but when you you know when you accept certain aspects about yourself when you accept your shadow self as Jung says right like everyone has a has a side of them that they either don't want to admit to themselves or around them but when you start to you know accept that shadow self I feel like you can go ahead and dispel your ego at any point you like so, so I've been going on for a long time, but yeah. <laughs> no, that was nice. Um, just a quick one then, just to see what you'd say. When you're in that state, um, in a psychedelic state, and you're looking at yourself in the mirror, if I came along and asked you, who are, who are you then, what would you say? I feel like we'll have to really do that in real life to know. <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> because, it, it, like, you know, like I remember there was this one trip I had um and uh this was a very significant trip this was a high dose lysergic trip that i had taken uh inside the comfort of comfort of my zone set in setting is perfect right um also around my family which could be a daring thing for a lot of people to do but i took it and there was obviously there's a peak time that people like that i guess all psychedelic users can say that there's a peak time right like when you're in um into the three to four hour mark into the journey right that's when the that's when you really start to lose yourself right like not you lose yourself but like lose your ego completely and so i remember i lost all my ego like i was just lying down and i was looking at the ceiling right because the ceiling is a the ceiling was obviously the entire thing was white so it was acting like a green screen right and i was obviously having visual hallucinations so i was lost in the psychedelic tunnels that you see uh, Alex Gray or any of these visionary artists that they paint, right? Like there's faces here, there's tunnels here. You're just lost in that. And then you would just remember, I remember thinking, who am I? Okay, what is this? Like I like for a second, I, and then that scared me for a little bit. Like I had some anxiety, which is so weird that I still remember that. But then I stood up, I went into the washroom. It was a whole thing. Like I was just Okay, you know, like my parent, like my brother was just like looking at me like that, like, are you okay? Like, is everything okay? But I, I enter and there's a mirror in front of me. And what I saw was that the, my entire face was morphing, right? Like morphing in the sense that it was moving, right? And my eyebrows, my nose, and just my lips, right? So just this structure was constant. And eyes, obviously. But the rest of the face was like, morphing so I was seeing my myself becoming old then young then a baby face then like you know like it, it was like I was traveling through time but stationary so it was a very insane hallucination and what I realized in that uh, in that no ego state when I'm looking myself in the mirror is that there are certain objective elements within your life that stay constant while certain things around you completely change right so my if my face is morphing and just my eyebrows and my nose and my lips is just like static right like I'm thinking okay why is just this static and why is this entire face morphing right like there has to be because what I am most um uh, you know I guess pissed about with certain people is that they do these psychedelic trips and they don't analyze it they do it for fun, right? But when you really start analyzing the trips that you take, and that's why I respect psychedelics in that way. I don't abuse them. You can't really abuse them, first of all. But you take them as a tool to understand yourself. And so you really have to look at these like very trippy aspects of the trip to kind of understand you. And so that's how I really got the concept of having no ego. When you don't have an ego, when you don't have a concept of an I, concept of yourself, you realize the absurdity of it all you really realize the absurdity of it all. Like, you know, how 
we go out and we think that oh this is me i i make okay 70000 every day on the wall street or something you know like you have like these external things in life that you value so much and you have that and and that's how you equate yourself also like that's how this is my worth this is like materialism right like materialistic things are my extension and therefore it being an extension by virtue also has uh, some sort of a direct significance on me and so when you are within that no ego state that is lost you don't have that anymore you don't have that materialism you the 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 different things that you try to connect to yourself to justify yourself to yourself you know you don't have that anymore and when you don't have that anymore you see yourself as you and now what are you that's always going to be a symbolical image right so for me it was like i from what i got was like objectively i am this just visually this is me okay like so that's that's what i thought at first like maybe that's what it means like that's what i was able to dissect from it but at the end of the day it's like what is singularity who am i you because okay one of the best ways to put it would be i'm not sure whether you guys have watched breaking bad okay in breaking bad um Walter White says this thing about chemistry, right? Like it's a, uh, like chemistry is transformation, right? It's different states, it's like you're constantly changing, right? Uh, solids to gases, gases to, you know, whatever. Um, solids to liquid, liquids to gases. And so, you know, it's like, a, it's like a study of change, right? And when you look at the entire Breaking Bad, Walter White is changing like right like the th the whole thing is getting darker it's like it's like you go through someone's life and so maybe what i saw in myself that time or what i thought that i was at that time i am not anymore you know like i'm not anymore at this at this moment if i do if i if i am able to via meditation or psychedelic able to get to that state where i lose ego the answer would always be different i think i'm not sure like it's it's interesting to explore this. I feel like for me, every other day, it would be a different answer. Because you're constantly involving, you're constantly changing, you're constantly grasping new things. You know, and especially if you are a person who tries to study yourself and, and the immediate external environment, let's say on a almost a daily basis, you know, you're just transforming yourself constantly. And so who are you at any given moment? The answer is always going to be different. So um, what's it like now then? Because you've had your ego that's sort of dissolved a bit and you're a lot more self-aware. Have you noticed like big differences to yourself? Sorry, I was muted. Sure. Um, okay, I think... I think I'm a I think I'm a very curious creator, right? Like I like to dissect things in life. That that would be a very objective answer. I feel like if you ask me this tomorrow, it would be the same thing. Maybe today I would be able to point out certain elements of it that tomorrow I won't agree with, right? Like you can have nuances, I guess, technically to that. Um a curious creator, a reductionist to a certain extent, but not completely. Um and I just love experiences, different experiences. So now there's like these different, different keywords and now you can make a new term for it, but you know, it's, it's an amalgamation of all of that. Or maybe like at the very heart of it, I, I like to say that I'm a creator in the sense that I take things around myself and create something new just for the fun of it, or just for the intellectual curiosity of what that creation would entail ultimately, right? Like one of the things that I do that um, I love doing is making flowcharts or like uh, visualizations, right? Of different concepts, different things. Um, I love doing that. Why do I love doing that? Because I feel like I understand more by, by doing that. You know how people say there's this concept of art therapy, like when, you, when you're making art, you're trying to heal yourself. In a way, I'm like that. Like I, if I, and that's why I'm also very multidisciplinary and something like my parents sometimes get frustrated about They're like, why aren't you studying like psychology today? Why are you studying loop quantum gravity? Like, well, how does that connect? Like, you know, with this, it's, it's simple curiosity to know about things and simple curiosity to dissect things, okay? And reductionism, I feel like is a way of, of me to like really just cut everything down to that one thing and then connect it all the way. So like bo bottom, 
down to top up, you know, whatever you want to, that kind of processing. You use that like, okay, bottom up. Now I can also go top down and bottom up, like, you know, vice versa. Like if you do it once, then you can do it again, as above, so below, right? So it's like that. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it's like that right these days. I feel like that's quite a good way to answer the question of who are you? I think you could, you are your experiences. Um, and that's kind of what, what makes you. So I, that's how I'd probably answer that question. Mm, yeah, maybe. Um, I think one bit I gathered from that was um, something that Marcus Aurelius talks about when he said that fundamentally all we are is change. We are change. We are never one thing, um, especially if you live like, a philosophical life in inverted commas. You're constantly evolving um, and we change through our experiences. That's how we mould who we are. Um, and it's not a stagnant thing. And I think also if you you stop and you identify to a certain type of person and then like claim that as who you are, then that becomes like the, the punishment of that is that you are stuck as that, you know, as soon as you seek to define yourself, you then remain stuck, you know? So maybe you shouldn't really like um, stick to an identity and kind of mm. just always be formless. Um... Yeah. I mean, someone asked me the other day, literally last week, what they said, ironically, what do you want to do when you grow up? I didn't really know how to answer that question. I genuinely didn't. Like I said, do you want a job title or do you want a philosophical statement? <laughs> That's genuinely what I said, right? And they were like, I don't know, you choose. Um, but good point though. You want to see what life takes you. Yeah, like what do you want to be when you grow up? Like you want if you if you put just a one single like noun word of like, I'm gonna be this thing, that's all you'll ever be, man. But I think human beings are bigger than that. I think humans and that human beings are up. Yeah, definitely. I think human beings are bigger because, than... Because their parents, like, add things onto them. of like, I want you to be this. Mm. They go and achieve it, and then they feel lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I've mentioned it on an episode before, but um, I'm paraphrasing, but there's this idea from Oscar Wilde where he says, if you know what you want to be when you grow up, then the punishment will be that you become that and you remain as that forever. But the person who doesn't know what they want to be as the reward of being anything they ever want to be at any given moment or something along those lines. Um, yeah, I've so said yeah. that before. If, if you know what you want to be, the punishment is that you'll become it. Just think about that. Wow, that's beautiful. That is very beautiful. And that is so correct. And this is what I was saying about, like, way before, like, about art and, like, how art, like, is a really good mechanism of understanding reality at the end of the day. Or reflecting it you know by the way of doing it you're also kind of th therapizing yourself in a way and that's like really breaking bad was such a great thing that i watched because like everyone was telling me to watch it like and i just kept on ignoring it i was like okay it's a great tv of all time okay yeah okay cool i'll watch it and then there was this one day i was extremely bored i started watching one episode three days later i finished the entire thing right and at the end of the three days i'm sitting like you know that uh that narcos meme like uh, you know just sitting like you know like wondering okay what did I just watch right it was so powerful and that also kind of like made me really understand really grasp this concept of transformation constant transformation that we go through and also this aspect of present present time right like what I was maybe three hours ago I still might not be that you know, and it's so crazy when you look at it, because like in psychopathology, we have this uh, disorder called uh, disassociative identity disorder. So having multiple identities, right? How interesting is it for those people then, right? Like this is sometimes where I try. And sometimes I feel like, under like going back to the chaos and order thing, right? If you try to understand order, you inevitably kind of grasp chaos. And when you try to understand chaos, you inevitably grasp what order is. So good and bad. Like, how would I recognize what is good if I don't know what is bad? And and sometimes just really looking at good, you kind of like can perceive what it might be to mean what is bad. Like, you know what I mean? It's like a very um, intuitive or like a very philosophical way or whatever you want to call it, way of looking at things. But when I was watching Breaking Bad, it was... It was literally that because you had that one image at start, at the start that Walter White is this, you know, where he, he's going through something, he's a sad guy, couldn't achieve, maybe certain things didn't go his way. 
you know, because of the things themselves and not him, right? Like this is the kind of perception you have at the very start. And at the very end, you're like, it was always there. It was always there. You, it, like it was always there. It was just him making all of these decisions, him going deep into what he could have been, but in a situation that is not ideal. So how do I reduce that to a finer point? I guess when we first see what, like you guys have watched Breaking Bad, right? Like I'm not just, uh, yeah. like you has have some idea, right? Okay. So like at first you have like this very clean, clean image of this guy and you're look and, and that's why people were like, yeah, Walter White, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're rooting for the guy. The very first right? thing is him like about to kill himself, isn't it? Yeah, you're really rooting for like at the end of the episode, you're still like, okay, maybe he's a bit out of it, but like he's still, you know, a good guy. He's still doing it for his family or whatever. Like he's going through something and he's he's trying to look for ways to aid those symptoms in, in his life. And it's okay. Everyone does that, right? And then as slowly, slowly you see him going, okay, I will get out now. I will get out of this business now. I will get out of this But Like he continues because he what he could have been, right? Like the, when you look at the past story of the guy where he wanted to, you know, get a lot of money out of Grey Matter, the company that he wanted to work with, or get that same status, like his friends, right? Like have that, because he's an intelligent guy. He wants that, like that level of narcissism, right? And you see that level of narcissism just exploding throughout it, how he's treating his family. Because if you're doing it all for the family and at the end, you know, there's a scene with his wife and he's saying, I did it. And you just go like, like what? You started a meth business and you went, like you put your family through hell to help them. And then it becomes absurd. So the very idea that is instilled in you in the very start, in the very beginning, this white image of the sky, and then you see the shadow, the complete shadow that he becomes, right? The complete shadow self that he just transforms into Heisenberg, right? Like, whoa. <laughs> so it's it's very interesting that that piece of cinema or that piece of, piece of art and culture or whatever was able to really communicate that idea to me, even though I've even though intuitively I feel like I can understand transformation, right? Like I can understand the very concept of transformation in a philosophical or, or a psychological behavioral or even in a, how, how particles move, right? Like even in a physical state matter sense. But it was really through watching that, right? That I was able to understand that at the core. I don't know, like I'm sure you guys must have had cinema, or pieces of music or like something related to art and culture that really made you grasp a certain idea i don't know did you guys ever do you do you, do you guys know what i mean like hmm. uh, Joe used to... i think um music i mean i'm not really a big film guy there are some films that obviously have affected me and in, in the way i look at life and stuff but I'm a big music guy and I'm a big, I'm, I've been thinking a lot at the moment about how what we listen to affects how we look at life um, and how standardized like pop music and in inverted commas just fills our brains with this unbeautiful bullshit and it sort of distracts us into this game of life that we feel like we should be playing and we're compelled to play by social pressure because it's all about sort of instant gratification and um, and just like there's no depth to it you know it's very surface level stuff um what music when, matrix at the other that's it yeah exactly and but when you move to like i listen to a lot of classical music i listen to a lot of spanish music spanish medicine music and and those kind of genres right it opens me up to actually the beauty there is in life um, and that's how i like to start each day is with some kind of song like that as i just look out my window and I see the sun shining through the leaves and it just reminds me that like, oh, there is peace here. And it's interesting to think about how, what that, that's a piece of art. That's a, a, co a composition of sounds that communicates a level of peace to me um, that is different to another song that communicates something different. And you need, you know, I'm not going to listen to classical music in the gym a lot of the time. You know, when I'm in, when I'm training, I want something aggressive. You know what I mean, but I wouldn't want to wake up to that kind of thing. So it's, it, it depends on the the it depends where on the homeostasis scale you want to be in your own mind, right? Sometimes you've got to go into mental stress to perform, 
and uh, you like dog. dog. You have a, you have a month in the gym. Yeah, that was sort of a phase. But then, but then the reason I enjoy the opera in the gym, right, is because I was listening to the opera and I was looking about everyone listening to like the heavy metal and their rap and stuff and how sort of like angry they were. And I was just there like floating around like an angel, just like doing my workout, like, you know. But um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's what I would say. Um, but what do you think, Jacob? Any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, the problem with rap is it's like a short-term ego boost um short term dopamine hit and like you feel like you have the lifestyle the glorified lifestyle but when you mm. turn it off then you compare yourself to who you are now to that person that you're listening to that's the that's what i found recently with rap um i think it's it, it's it resonates with i think young men particularly because there is kind of like a higher goal for them to get to and um that's why i initially got into it and there's um I think um to me Kendrick Lamar sticks out as um a very very powerful figure um because his um extreme attention to detail to metaphors and um his storytelling how he got out of his situation and then became who he is today um so I would say there are exceptions to that um, and there is art to be found in rap, so I, I won't slag it off. But um, it's something to be careful of when you're listening about what, listening to it. Um, I I can relate to the classical music thing. I think there's a lot of beauty in classical music. I uh, I was reading something about Mozart in um Ma the book Mastery, where he creates his um compositions, and the the he does it with um very eccentric um aggressive style that hasn't been um that isn't really appreciated um and so his his dad's like um disproves of it um because of what he creates um but it, he he puts all his emotions into into these um sounds that we now hear today is like that they're in films and there's a reason that they're in films because they ha they they channel the anger um in, into into sounds and um you really feel the emotions in in these in these things which then elevates the scene um i'm less i'm less of a movie guy i'm less of a series guy uh, but I am a music guy. Um, it's interesting. I think that, um, sorry, just to jump in on the Mozart bit. It's kind of like where right, he had an emotion or an experience, right? And then he channeled that emotion, the experience, into a piece of art, right? He made made a, a movement or a composition or or a song or whatever. They weren't really songs. I feel like that's not doing it justice. But anyway, um, and then hundreds of years later, that piece of art is able to be put on top of a movie scene. And then it helps communicate the same experience or same emotion that Mozart went through. It's almost like that creation process then put his experience into eternity. Like it meant that that experience could be then re-experienced across time just through listening to it. So I think when a lot of the, so I'll give some context into why I like Spanish medicine music is that I was introduced to that genre on my first mushroom trip, right? So every time that I listen to that genre, whether I'm high or not, it takes me into this state of like peace and letting go. And like life is good. You know, life is great. You get to breathe. You get to be here. You get to see nature. Like all is well. So it's interesting how it can be, you know, film or or, or TV or music or, or painting or, or whatever it is, right? But art communicates experience in a way that we can't really articulate through language. It's like it's a feeling to feeling thing. If you try and get in, get and try and like use your intellectual mind and rationalize it all, it kind of takes away from the point, I think. But yeah.
I'm also a very big music person, big on music, like big on music and films because I was like my uh, my dad is very much into films. So growing up, I was watching a lot of films. I was going to the cinemas every Friday, watching every movie that was, you know, getting there. And my dad's dad used to buy DVDs and back in the day when we used to have those and 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 watch literally all genres, right? Like thrillers to horror to a lot of horror, uh, a lot of drama, a lot of historical drama. A lot of documentary stuff like that uh but i was I, i'm big into music um and so it's very interesting i never knew about the spanish medicine music is it like a side <laughs> trance like uh, it has to be is it forest side like was it what is it um, how would you i can uh, send you kind of like I'll, genre? I'll, after yeah. the episode i'll send you um this album and it will change your life <laughs> definitely that. please do uh <laughs> like i'm big in i'm big i'm big into electronic music i feel like so the way, you know, how, how we were talking about life is a constant change, like constant change, right? Like constant transformation. Um, music as a, like a particular genre, I feel like it was a, it was a very um, progressive thing, right? So at first, I feel like I remember very early on, just the mainstream music, whatever that was on the radio, right? Back in the day. Then when I got the iPod, I remember, um, and you used to get the CDs as well. Um, the very mainstream pop music, right? Uh, so 2010, it was like what Eminem and Rihanna and like, like you know, all of these big names that were there, and 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 mostly because being at, at, on the side of the world, being in the east, uh, I had a lot of local music, and then I had whatever I perceived of the west was the mainstream music that I was getting here, right? So VH1, whatever VH1 was playing, I was listening to that. Um, so mostly, I guess, pop music. Then sometime around, like, obviously the internet is here, the iPod is here. Uh, sometime around 2012, 2014, I started listening to melodic EDM. That was back in the day known as, like, so Hardwell, Avicii, um, Afrojack, stuff like that. You know, those were the people of those times. Uh, so I started listening to melodic. And a so melodic, I would, so how would I characterize techno, right? Like techno or the electronic music movement. You can, you can dissect that. So there's one umbrella, which is purely techno. And then there's another umbrella, which is psytrance, right? So techno, you can dissect into melodic, progressive, hard style, right? And then you have psytrance here and psytrance is, uh, so again, melodic is also there. So like some beats with some disruptions. Like if you listen to say trance, you'll you'll understand the difference. Like it's not like a normal, it's not like something you normally get into. You have to develop a taste for it. And then you have the forest side, which is more darker, more mystical, right? So there's always the melodic progressive and then the industrial warehouse, uh, dark heart style, you know, kind of styles both in techno, like just the electronic aspect and, and then the mystical extension of it, which is Psytrance, right? Um, and it's very interesting because I didn't know that Psytrance actually originated in 1990s Goa scene in India. <laughs> it was very crazy when I first got to that. I was like, why it came from here? I was like interested. Um, but it's it's essentially that, like if you really just like, I mean, I could make like a mind map out of it now, but like it's that. Oh, uh, but interesting. So you hit you hit up on Spanish medicine music. Do send me that. Do, do you know it's what's interesting, interesting as well, too. right? Is when when I was mm -hmm. um in the first year or so, and even to this day, when I was coming into what I consider my awakening to like self discovery and wanting to put my life in order and have that discipline in different areas of my life, I listened to a lot of melodic house music all the time. Like I remember back in the day when I sort of I disconnected myself from my old friend group who I no longer resonated with um I spent a lot of time um in my own head and one of the things that kept me going through like lockdown and stuff was um the workouts I used to do in my bedroom my home workouts right and I used to listen to just like Spotify there's this hundred hour Spotify playlist of just like melodic house music um that I just put on shuffle for like an hour and 45 minutes and it would take me somewhere else um, so it's interesting you bring that up. I wouldn't expect that, but I, I rate that. Well, it's it's kind of like there's no vocals or anything, so no. it's really just that. Um, it's really challenging us using production only to create a such a specific feeling. Mm. Um, I mean, you put yours into like night songs and morning songs, and yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I sent I sent oh you some my... of my house music, didn't I? Jake? Yeah, yeah, no, no, good. Do you know what I'm I do that too, by the way. I really do that. So you know what? How Jake was talking about rap music, and then you were also saying, you know, this aggressive music that people might listen in gyms or whatever. So this is how my day goes, right? Like, if I need to do something, if the, like if it's not a Sunday, let's say it's a Monday, right? Like you've got things to do. I would wake up and I feel like okay. Usually you want to stay in bed for 10 more minutes, you know, that lazy 10 the demons, more minutes. The and then I'll wake up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it comes out like this. <laughs> and so you're 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 trying to tackle that, you know, and, and and what I would be playing, I am that person that plays the aggressive music to like get my stimulant, you know, natural stimulants going inside my body, you know. So and and it's so crazy that if I listen to uh, you know, you were talking about Kendrick Lamar, right? So family ties, if you know that song, right? Yeah. Goes like ta 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 ta. And and I'm just like, it's it's like it's a very so it's it's so funny also because like I was I was uh showing um uh, this <laughs> let's say family ties only to like this person who is in his forties and he listens to Forest Psy, like the most mystical Psy trance there is on an everyday basis without the need of any psychedelic. He's in that stage in his life, you know, like, there's different stages in life, I feel so. Just like, you know, transformation again. And and I was making him, and I was, you know, I was like, going like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's like so much aggressive and vulgar and whatnot in there, right? And then he goes like, do you guys not rap anything about anything other than you know the n-word then yeah. the liquor the drugs you know just like the vulgar like do you guys not talk about any of mm. anything other than that anymore right like you know the modern rap scene is like that only um, um and i was like like there's um there's a kendrick song called how much does a dollar cost um which <laughs> is like the total opposite to like most popular hip-hop songs because I mean, it's it's basically Joe. It's, it's a concept about it's a storytelling song where, um, Kendrick walks past like a homeless person and he doesn't give him the money, and then that homeless person ends up being God testing him, mm. um, for for his, like kindness, and then I think it like comes back to spite him, um, yeah. But really, if you listen to that kind of music, for me, you know, everyone has a different. You know, like some people like to listen to melodic st stuff when they're in gym, like, you know, Joel, like you want to be calm and disciplined in that way. Very interesting. I'm like aggressive like that, you know, like my parents would walk in and they're like, what are you playing? Like, like lower the volume. What are you playing? Honestly, you know, it's like 9 a.m. in the morning and there's hard techno going on, dun, 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 like 190 BPM, like, you know, like dun, 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 dun. dun. And my parents are like, what happened? What? Like, you know, it's like, I'm trying to wake up right now. Like I'm trying to stimulate myself, get into that, or it's rap, you know, or it's aggressive rap or Cardi B and like, you know, all of those crazy rappers are just, you know, where you're just talking about, oh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. So you can get into that state that's like, okay, now I can work. You know, now I'm, sti I'm feel stimulated. It's like, instead of having that morning cup of coffee, I just listen to that kind of music. And that's how I my day gets started. Then in between, if I'm trying to relax, then I listen to some melodic stuff, you know, um, to, to kind of calm myself down. Classical music also, like sometimes, and film scores also, actually. Hans Zimmer, and then, you know, the Oppenheimer one is also very good. Mm -hmm. the, the entire soundtrack is very good. Dune, I did not like the soundtrack that much. It's very up and down but um i guess Hans Zimmer and then that guy who did the soundtrack for joker film mm. so such a european name i can't like really it's a, it starts with a g both names are gg you know or something and then it's a very european name uh but uh, very difficult to pronounce for an eastern person but very interesting you you try to like stabilize your day like so afternoon is mostly that right like melodic um film scores uh and then also like any any kind of lyrical music. Okay, maybe maybe Lana Del Rey, but not that extremely depressive. Lana Del Rey, just like, you know, the, like that vibe. Aurora or Lana Del Rey, or I don't listen to the very new people that are coming out, unfortunately. I just feel like it's, some of the music just doesn't make that much sense to me anymore. Like I spies and all of those people, it just doesn't make any sense anymore to me. I can't, I can't, I can't handle those lyrics like in a melodic structure i don't know why it's so weird it's, it's interesting like, you know. like how like music can just hype you up though it is it's actually a life hack to just the like the first thing you do when you're battling the demons just play some song to hype you up out of bed in the morning 
Mm. Um, and then you're rolling. It's it's interesting that sometimes they, like, they was nice as well. Though, like I, I was walking to campus and I was like listening to Frank Sinatra, and it was just yes, so lad. beautiful. Yes, lad, that's it. Like I, honestly, like the mode of just oh, sometimes I just want to wear a suit and play Frank Sinatra, even if I've got no event on. Do you know what I mean like a suit and a fedora and just go into the world? I, I want to do that. Just go into Aldi and just like play Frank Sinatra and get an old car or something. Like and just. It's just amazing isn't it, how music can put you in certain modes. And you're talking about hyping you up, right? When when I'm training and I'm doing some like horrific like grunt work conditioning stuff where like my heart feels like it's in my throat and I'm sweating into my eyes and I'm snotting all over my shorts and stuff. And it's so interesting. <laughs> I'm completely depleted physically, right? I just really can't push on anymore. And then a certain song will come on and I'll find another 50% in my tank. And it's like, that wasn't even, it didn't even feel like that that power was there, right? But I've just heard some noises and now suddenly I'm locked in and I'm ready to go. And what what happens there? What's going on? It's ridiculous. But yeah. It's essentially a transcendental state, right? Like mm. the whole thing with EDM was like, oh, it's trans music. There's a reason why it's called trans music, not the trans people to write trans music. <laughs> I'm not, you know, just a simple joke right there. So I hope you guys are not too liberal. <laughs> Do not take that as a joke. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. You know, people get people get triggered these days. Um, anyway, that was a harmless joke. Anyway, uh, but yeah, you know, you uh, it, there's a reason why it's called transcendental music or electronic trans music, right? Because there's beats and those beats are inducing in, inducing a certain transcendental hypnotic state in you. So I feel like side trance, it tries to do that hypnotic thing mostly. But um, if you subtract the hypnoticism from this transcendental state, you get that complete transcendental state in other technological genres, right? So progressive or hard style or whatever. It's always there. It puts you in a, like, you know, you go, like, you know, if you go into any of these, really good like i'm not talking about just you walk into any club and see what what movements they're doing but if you go to like these very dedicated like clubs to a certain genre right so you know how there's a, a Borgine club i guess in germany that does uh in berlin that just does industrial warehouse and some progressive melodic house right <laughs> and you go in there and you see the way people are dancing freely everything is like your entire body movements is translated into the beats that is playing right so just why are the act of listening reasoning and then translating that into movements right so being present in that very movement based but also psyche interacting with music based kind of state right you are you have ascended i feel like in frequency to a to a higher dimension of of existence right to a higher dimension of understanding love empathy even the negative emotions if you're listening to like death metal or you know you're like yeah 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 like rap you know um the little baby is going on stage you know like and you're just in that state it's 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 a it's a way of like inducing evoking that state that i feel like normally people have a hard time evoking right like if people would drink caffeine in the morning to get stimulated right and i said that if you really if you if you're able to understand what heart style or like aggressive rap or death metal is maybe you don't need that coffee in the morning maybe you can you know self-medicate yourself with art instead of self-medicating yourself with you know actual medicines pharmacology i feel like the more i'm growing up the more i'm learning the value of staying natural you know like staying it being away from external things that could possibly have keep on having those influences within you that you know make you a certain way because you know like even with caffeine intake i've noticed that one year ago um i stopped taking caffeine completely um and uh I, what I noticed was when I took that coffee after and that coffee was just you know pure 100% Arabica coffee instant coffee I made it and I had once two, two three sips I actually felt caffeine it is so hard to feel caffeine in a day-to-day -day. if you're taking it regularly you don't feel it at all it's just like a it's like you know it's just like a water it's just like you're drinking water honestly you don't feel it but when you're away from it for a very long time and then you try it again, it's like a very beautiful thing. It's like smoking weed, right? Right. If you continuously do it, at some point you gain a certain tolerance, at a certain point you just don't enjoy it anymore. 
right? You needed that tolerance break to go back to it, right? And so it's the same thing. But as I'm growing up, I'm realizing maybe art or certain experiences could do the same things that I'm trying to do with pharmacology to me, right? And that way I can stay more disciplined. That way I can obviously live longer and and be able to really also understand reality at the same time. Like the reason why I got into researching psychopharmacology essentially was purely, okay, how much craziness inside my mind can I really put a like a telescope into and just see, right? So taking all different kinds of substances, how they affect your brain, how it affects your behavior, what can you learn from it? And um, how could it be possibly useful if you have to take it, right? So that was my initial thing. And three years after, you know, kind of tapping into these things, I realized that art is a perfect substitute for this thing. I don't, I don't need caffeine. I don't need any kind of stimulants or any of that, you know, to be focused, to be self. I could, I could play aggressive rap, death metal or this, and I am, you know, motivated enough to be in that state already naturally. And it's a very beautiful thing to be able to self-medicate yourself with art so that you don't have to abuse your body with medications. Very interesting perspective. But I feel like, again, it's like a very transformative thing. You have to go through that stages in your life to, to be able to become that self-aware that you realize that, you know, this could be a really good mechanism. And then that ties back to the very start of this podcast, how to stay disciplined, right? People... Um, you know how you go to gym, right? So I'm, I'm sure you guys go to gym. And so, you know how there's people taking creatine and protein powders as supplements or any other supplements that you use, right? To, to do that. I'm like, do you, I mean, I, I understand the protein powder maybe after a very heavy workout. I understand those supplements. Creatine, question mark. You know, it's a very, it's a very um, controversial one. But maybe just maybe i guess working out like that and you could you can find an artistic substitute to that and 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 in the very long term it's actually beneficial to you rather than being detrimental to your health i don't know what do you guys think about like i guess substituting art or artistic means or cultural expressions instead of pharmacology or any anything that could have a potential harm towards you in the long term? Hmm. I think it's definitely easier to escape in a song or a film rather than use a, a drug that will have detrimental effects long term, for sure. Um, I am a victim of the, the caffeine conveyor belt of waking up in the morning and... Uh, you know, I find a lot of joy. <laughs> I find a lot of joy in um, an iced coffee with Spanish music. You know, uh, looking outside my window, thinking about life. Um, but I think there will be a time where I say, "Right, Joel, we're going to end that now." But I think my my routine is at a point where I need to be able to perform. You know, maybe when I'm older and that's not as important, I can be a bit more experimental. But no, I like I like your your thinking, and I do think that that we can embody a piece of art like when you listen to a certain music you can then channel the energy into what you're doing whether that be something aggressive or something more peaceful but yeah what do you think jacob um the only thing i, I agree with that and um it's kind of made me think about my caffeine intake as well um, <laughs> the only thing I'll add to that is like sometimes um if you listen to music or you consume art too much mm -hmm. It gets too familiar, it gets too repetitive, and so you have to mm. take a gap from it and then come back to it maybe a month in a, in a month's time. Um, so I think it's good to cycle through it. Um, I also kind of wanted to pivot the conversation a little bit, and um, I wanted to talk about the consciousness flow chart. Um, could you from your Substack? Um, could you uh explain that a little bit more? Sure. I'm also gonna pull it up on my screen here. So, but you guys can see me, see me still, right? Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Do you want to share? Do you want to share your screen? Uh, screen with us so we can see it as well, because I can give you those rights on the call. Yeah. No. Sure. I would love to do that. It's just this is a Windows laptop, and I'm so used to the Mac OS, and this is my dad's laptop because my Pug, 
walked through the keyboards and broke my Mac. You know, <laughs> no, <I did laughs> now <laughs> and now I'm trying to like understand. Okay, what is Windows again? It's like it's like when you use one operating system for so long. Like it took me a long time to understand how this Windows thing work. It's so mm-hmm. crazy, but I, I'll I'll try. I'll keep trying. Um, well, if I if I if I do this right, I've made you the host of the call. Then you can go down and see the options at the bottom. You've got like, uh, you can mute yourself and stop your camera and go to the chat and stuff. There's an option that says yeah. share screen. Yep. Let me do that way. Here we go. I'm trying to open the sub stack <laughs> here. Here. Let me. Okay. Share. Also, we have to go for an hour and 25 minutes, but I feel like we just keep going. <laughs> Are you guys seeing anything? Well, it um, says, it's, it says stuff? yes. Yeah, here we go. Right? Okay. Okay, cool. So let me pull that post up, right? Uh, okay, so that post, uh, okay, where the hell? The... Jesus Christ, dude. I'm like a 40-year-old person right now. <laughs> trying to understand how the hell does technology work it is it is crazy like it is a trip by the way if you if you do one operating system for a long time and then you just you just don't know like you know because intuitively very intuitively if you've been using one operating system for a very long time intuitively you just don't know where to go Mm -hmm. it's crazy explore writer dashboard has to be there okay pose and okay here I barely post on Substack, man. It's insane. So this one, right? And this one. Okay, there we go. Whoa, that's the bigger ultimate. than I thought okay. it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is this thing, because it's so, like, if you look at, obviously, you can't see sh- stuff, right? Like, you can't see shit. No, we're going to sh- say shit, but, like, can't see stuff. Like, I'll have to zoom. Hopefully, it's HD, or I'll have to open the academy or two. Yeah, it's not HD. Do you uh, do you have do you have this downloaded anywhere? Um, can I send it to you and it, you can pull it up? It was quite because like I'm long... gonna have a very hard time. <laughs> yeah. Can you not make it? A full I can send it to There's you. an option there, like the top right that comes up. Hopefully, it's an HD image because I have written down there that it's not truly HD. Okay, maybe yeah, you yeah, can no, no, I can read that. I can it's read not that. that pixelated. It's not that <laughs> pixelated. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this was actually a flowchart that I made out of this book, right? It's uh, called The Emotion Machine by Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky was this AI thinker. He was mainly in the field of AI, but he was also a philosophical thinker and had that kind of approach towards artificial intelligence on how he thinks thinks about systems and mechanisms and algorithms and all of the machine learning computer stuff also there's a book called perceptrons as well which is very mechanical that you can you know kind of understand how he writes so that's how he writes and there's this chapter about um just con- it's just called consciousness right it's just called consciousness and it has these so when you look at the very top cells it has these sections what is consciousness exploring the contents of one and what i did was break it down just break it down Okay, what is he trying to say? Because it was, a, by the end of this chapter, I went like, did I just understand the entire aspect of, con- obviously you don't understand consciousness, like just like that, but it was a fair summary of it, if anything, you know, it was a fair summarization of it. And so that's why I ended up putting my thoughts and then his way of looking at things, taking that together and making this thing. Um, anyway, what is consciousness, right? Multi asserted mental process involving varied cognitive functions. That's pretty obvious. Uh, Consciousness is not just awareness. So linguistically looking at consciousness as a term, it it means a lot of things. And that's where he starts uh, the discussion with, right? Like consciousness means a lot of different things. And at the same time, consciousness can be looked via different things like like there could be a relativistic perspective to it there could be a psychological perspective to it there could be a philosophical perspective you know there's like Mm. different ways that you can like look at these things and so it's a it's really like an umbrella term that we use for a lot of things and this is what i mean by that here and so i've i've divided into mainly four right physics psychology biology relativistic ways of looking at it and how it really how it really does that so like the beautiful way he 
describes this is that, oh, you know, like we look at it from a psychological perspective, that is that uh, conscious, how consciousness, how consciousness translates into affective states. So uh, how does our emotions and behavior, certain aspe aspect of how emotions, intuition and instinctive, instinctual drive as a psychological mechanism translates into what we think that we are at the moment. So what conscious, how conscious are we relating to our emotions? And so that aspect of it, the affective, emotional, psychological way of looking at it, that, that is one sector of it. Then we have biology, so sentience, right? Existence and, and the way our purely, the way our body operates and, and how being alive is being conscious. So there's that sector. Then we have this relativistic view that like that consciousness comes in degrees. What we were saying before, everything comes in degrees. Consciousness also comes. An atom could have a certain degree of consciousness, and a human being could have more than that atom, right? Because we are made up of atoms. So that's that's one way of looking at it. So that's a relativistic perspective of looking at. It. And then there's time, right? There's a physical. There's a memory, there's a physical and memorial aspect of looking at consciousness. And it really ties into the relati relativistic perspective. When we look at things having different degrees, having different scales. And now this is a very psychical way of uh, me explaining this, but there's atoms with different levels. Then we have uh, full functioning brains that are more capable than the atoms because when atoms come together, it's a whole, right? But in between that state of going from one atom to multitude of atoms and having like this cognitive functioning going on, there's a flow of time and memory. And, and I guess the best way to understand it would be the general relativity that Einstein does, right? Like his general relativity and then how space time works. I, I feel like that's how I really understood this this aspect that how is memory tied? Because it's when you go via degrees and when you go via scales, you're also moving in time, right? When an atom transforms into when an atom interacts with let's say another atom or an atom combines itself with a certain body of atoms, like you know, interacts with the nucleus of it and becomes another thing. Time memory there's a certain memory that that atom carried and assimilated into the multitude of the body of atoms that have distinct memory from them and now there's a combination of memory so there's that psychical aspect of memory and time psychical mystical unknown you know paradoxes of the universe whatever you want to you know label it as so that's like so consciousness could be understood in all of these different ways and it could have all of these different meanings. Essentially, that's what he's saying here. Then exploring the contents of consciousness. Freud can come in here. Pre-conscious, unconscious, pre-conscious, conscious, subconscious, unconscious, right? Like this four. But here I've only said conscious and then there's the unconscious because he also premises it that way. And I feel like most people don't really know what the pre-conscious and then the collective on call like you don't have that hierarchy like most people don't know but so I've just tried to like grasp it within just the conscious versus the unconscious so conscious obviously you're aware of your actions so everything is intentional unconscious obviously you're unaware so um you know like uh, there, there could be a certain trigger present in my environment that could induce a certain anxious symptom within my body and that anxious symptom which is being induced in my body could evoke a certain behavior, right? And so that behavior is impulsive, it's unconscious, it's unvol inv involuntary. And so that's what I'm really trying to get with the unconscious here, right? And folk psychology, like, you know, like when you, folk psychology is a very interesting term that I got across when I was do going through that chain of reasoning that I just laid out before, is that it's it's kind of it's kind of like a it's it's kind of psi like it's kind of like a psi trance like when you look at the unconscious it's so filled with um, symbols and archetypes and 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 substrate layers and traits that's really a dance that's like really a dance of these unknown unknown paradoxes and and they somehow manifest because of our because of the triggers present in our immediate external environment so that's really what folk psychology at the end of the day is like dance of 
you know, these unconscious paradoxes within us uh, at the very lower level of lower substrate of our mind, I guess. Then there's A brains and B brains. This is more like, um, this more comes into the biological aspect of it. So uh, there's a really good diagram that he has here. I'll just try to like show it to you guys. So hopefully you guys can, hopefully you guys can see, right? Like here, right? There's an external world in here. There's A, there's B, and then there's C brain. So obviously the A brain is interacting with the external world, right? So there's this external world around us. Now the air is flowing, so I'm feeling some sort of br breeze go by. Now that is my forced interaction with the internal external. So my A brain is reactive. It is the first primary layer, which is reacting to just stimuli, right? Then the B brain is deliberative or it is, you know, a performance, I would say reaction decoder, right? So if a reactive A brain is a performance conductor, right? Based on the phenomenal world, based on the interaction with the phenomenal world, the very primary, the very first thing that our brain does our conscious brain does with a layer of just subconscious things flowing because there's always a presence of the subconscious, right? There's always symbol symbolical unconscious archetypes that are present in even in our conscious states. We just don't know what it is, you know, most of the time. And so there's always that. And so the there's like the phenomenal world, there's the first layer. So the breeze is flowing and I'm feeling that breeze. And I'm giving a certain behavioral reaction and it's 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 getting encoded within me. The, now the B brain is like, okay, further analyzing it. C brain, further analyzing it, right? So think of it as a way of deconstructing things around you. De deconstructing very subtle things around you. Deconstructing behaviors of other people. There's levels. So the A brain, B brains here, and he actually goes to say there's a C brain also, right? is really a way of decoding things, decoding things around you, decoding specifically things that are stimuli-based, right? That is very much, there's a present stimuli and how it is interacting with me and how my brain has these three different layers of understanding, uh, understanding decoder, you know? So that's that. It's really just that, like this entire thing. And you see a different, different like ways that, that I've tried to, uh, kind of like just put it in keywords because it's a flow chart. You can't like really write the whole essay in it. Um, then there's overriding consciousness, recognition of objects above the utility of the observed object. So despite numerous processes, we must clarify their integration into our conscious continuous thought and the, define the resulting phenomena. So it's really measuring consciousness, measuring the the different elements of our conscious experience. That is the best way to explain. Measuring the different different mechanisms and different uh, layers of our conscious experience. So if earlier we were trying to decode it, earlier we, we were trying to get a surface level to uh, from A brain, so surface level, then deeper and deeper understanding of it. Now we're really trying to integrate it to our present experience. Uh, or present thoughts or memories or whatever. So if the, this breeze is flowing by and I'm evoking a certain behavior, what is that doing to me intellectually? That's really that. So measuring it in that way. So then there's that. Then how do we initiate consciousness? There's different ways here. Uh, monitor analyst, uh, illustrative depictions, um, the ubiquity delusion. It's, a, it's just a way to define the other two. And premature conclusion phenomena. These are just different theories, not interrelated, I would say. So how do we initiate consciousness? There's a problem. Okay, so these are, if you like, look at these terms, right? Like you can see that this guy was the AI guy because it's a very, you know, it's very systematic and algorithmic in that way. Problem identifier. Now you could translate that into psychology however way you like. And there's chief determinants, there's premium assets then you got illustrative depictions numerical and scientific okay let me do a quick <laughs> okay so one way of looking at it is we, we've got different different ways of how we initiate consciousness in the sense that how we recognize it 
yet play with the rhythm of it. So it's not like we're we're introducing new consciousness or any of that. It's just we're we're initiating our conscious experiential thoughts and 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 how are we doing that? Is it coming from a is it coming from like a, we we identify a problem and we cut it down into these reductionistic points and then we okay this is how like what is your way of processing things via initiating that conscious awareness within yourself it's really that it's very very psychological mystical whatever you want to call it and at the same time very structural so that's why the the say guy is talking about these things it's like there's different ways so beautiful way to understand this is compare this with psychoanalysis complete compare this with the triad of psychoanalysis right you could be having that freudian way of looking at things where everything is personal uh, everything is rooted deeply in biology so that's how you think about any any conscious stimuli interaction that you're having with anything so if this breeze is flowing by and i'm having this behavior re reaction i'm just recognizing okay there's air so i'm i'm looking at the objective elements of my experience and trying to define that so i can understand my own conscious awareness of that moment at that moment and so it's just a mechanism of understanding the way you introduce certain structures to further understand, not understand, but like further um, incorporate that experience in into yourself, I guess. That would be the best way to put it. And so there's a biological way to look at it. There's a very, very objective uh, biological way to look at things, logical, physical, however you want to call it. Then there's... Um, another way there's a visual way there's a artistic way there's a semantic way so this is what i was trying to get with the triad of psychoanalysis is a freudian way of understanding which is purely biological there's a jungian way of understanding which is purely analytical in the sense it doesn't only recognize biology but it also recognizes society and culture and and your interactions and that's how you look at things and then there's that semantic lacanian understanding of networks or, or experience or things. And so it's really that, that you could put here and try to like, you know, how do you, how do we initiate consciousness? These are the different ways you could do it. Then there's a mystery of um, experience. Consciousness's uh, varied meanings precluded from a unified theory. Defining consciousness as internal process awareness doesn't meet expectation. So it's really, this chapter or this element really taps into the certain things that still remain mysterious when we try to understand the con very concept of consciousness within this umbrella term, within as an umbrella term. So I guess you can't, like there are certain experiences, conscious and unconscious and, and subconscious, certain experiences on any scale that you just, really can't understand. So uh, what would be a good example of an experience that you can't understand? So you know how there was this um, moment that Freud and Jung had when they were talking about their dreams. And Jung was trying to explain, I guess, if I'm not mistaken, the concept of a premonition dream, right? So something is about to happen. I know it, you know it. We just don't know what exactly is going to happen, right? Like that feeling that something is going to happen and it happens, right? Freud and Jung are talking. He's trying He's trying to like explain that I had this dream and like, you know, this is concept, pre premonition dreams or whatever. And Freud is being dismissive of it because again, it's a mystical idea and Freud, Freud was very set in his ways in that way. And so, and then the book falls down and then a noise comes and he's like, boom, this is what I was trying to tell you. Something was going to happen and it happened, right? So it's a it's a mystery. How how do we know things before they happen? So those elements of those conscious elements, those those elements of consciousness that we cannot fully grasp, cannot fully explain. I guess that falls under here because we can never know consciousness fully because our mind still has the unconscious. We can understand the unconscious from a psychological perspective. We can do psychoanalysis, but we can never truly understand the unconscious. And that's why there's always going to be the mystery of the you know, mystery of experience within when we try to understand what conscious experiences are or the unconscious experiences are.
So there's, you know, it just taps into that. So th when you zoom out, it's really consciousness is all of these different things. Like that's the whole point. Like, you know, people say, people say that, oh, being conscious, being aware, you know, like you can, you can, uh, you know, what's that uh, philosopher guy's name? Um, Sam Harris. Yeah. You can listen to Sam Harris continuously about talking about conscious, but it's really not just one thing. It's like these many things. And so that's the whole point of the flow chart. It's like, how long did this take you to make? And was it just on some Tuesday evening when it was raining and you were sort of reading a book and you're like, right, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do this? Like, what was the thought process? Five hours. I'm pretty sure it was five hours. And I did not even feel like it was five hours. Like when you're in that flow state of just you know, making art or creating things that I love doing, I lose track of time. Time becomes non-existent when I'm creative. It's crazy. It it just doesn't exist, it ceases to exist. Like I don't have any concept of time. I'm just going at it and five hours later I'm like aha I made it and then I look at the time I'm like fuck like you know there's so much time has passed but like whatever and just making this you know and like this is not like I'm not gonna get rewarded for this obviously in any way it's just like a personal personal art therapy thing or whatever you want to call it but it took a lot long time but at the end of it at the end of making this flow chart I was able to like dispel these preconceived notions that I used that I inquired why are my studies or that I thought that I knew what consciousness is. I, I by the end of this, I knew that I knew nothing. I, I understood the Socratic paradox, right? That the more you try to know something, the more, you, the less you understand. <laughs> you know, the, the more you become aware of your own ignorance, right? And it was a very interesting way of coming to that conclusion, right? When I went through this entire thing, starting from, oh, what is consciousness? Okay, what, uh, you know, what what is the linguistic uh, diverse meaning of it? What are the different ways of looking at it? All the way towards, okay, what is the mystery, mysterious aspect of consciousness? Like all these things, you think that you know now all of the sectors, but you really don't. By the end of it, you're more confused than ever. You have more questions than ever, right? That you have you're deep into the Socratic paradox that, shit, I really don't know anything. You know, it's it's really that. And it's it's a very humbling, you know, <laughs> idea that, that got into my head. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. But that's how usually flowcharts work for me, honestly. It's just it's just a way of understanding things. And at the end, you just have more questions and and you feel like you have grasped it. You have looked at a, looked at it from a multifaceted way. But there's that there's that humility within you that I still don't know anything. You know, yeah. there's that there's that Kant, you know, whatever you want to thinking of. I don't know anything. I really like Socratic, not Kant. I like how you've gone into so much detail, and it just you can tell it's just been driven by like pure curiosity. Do you know what I mean? But because we're sort of like running out of time now, and I just want to ask, I want to ask you one final thing before we go in the last sort of five mm -hmm. ten minutes, um, and that is. I reckon there's going to be a lot of people that might listen to this or see this and be like, why would you bother thinking so deeply about these kind of things? Like, why why bother whatsoever? And I want to know what you would say to someone who asked you that question, someone who looked at that diagram you just made us or listened to this conversation, all the things that you said, and were very cynical and thought, why bother? What would be your response to that? And I think that's a good point to end today on. Sure. I mean, I guess I'll give you a very self-aware realization, realizational answer to this, right? Like at first I used to think, and this is very psych psychology and personal experience based. At first I used to, I used to have this notion that the more, you know, the more you can, I guess, flex in society. You, I know everything, you know, like it was more of, it had a narcissistic tone to it. I feel like at first, but then, like, after, you know, going, like, four years into this kind of stuff, I realized that why is it is it that I'm actually deeply interested or is it that I'm trying to impress others by being this way, right? Like, the, there was that question inside my head. I was like, most of psychological experiences I've had in early childhood, right? So you have that anxiety of impressing others or constant admiration that you want to be getting out of others. I thought at first it was that. And then when I started thinking whether I'm actually a narcissist, intellectual thinker, you know, I had that, am I a narcissistic intellectual thinker? I was like, maybe, you know, maybe. And then when I really started thinking, it really put me into a depressive state and I stopped being active for a whole year. 
after that. I was just not active. I was I was doing my readings. I was doing I was making things. I was just you know, posting it just to test that out. You know, just to test whether I am doing this for myself or is it like a continuous interaction with society, like a mental masturbation or oh, like I'm this, I'm that. Like you know, what was it that? And after one year of not doing like not. I guess flexing or any of that, not putting it out there, not like having it open to criticism or praise or any of that. I realized that it's actually a very inherent thing because when I started to look at my life, when, when there was no presence of social media, it was the most beautiful thing ever. Because it was like, I'm understanding a concept and now I can, now I don't have to like, I didn't have that like childhood mentality of pleasing others. Oh, like I know this thing. So like, you know, I'll get a praise out of it. I did not have that anymore. So I feel like right now, earlier I used to feel like there was an artistic element to it. Now I feel like I don't care. So now this I don't care kind of thinking about just life experiences. I feel like I'm just doing it for myself now. And I feel like I just like to know the core of things. So this is what I meant by like the, the, the having a reductionistic perspective towards things. I like to have that top down uh, thinking, uh, cognitive functioning towards all the external immediate environment experiences, stimuli, triggers, you know, whatever I'm interacting towards that. I just like to, I just like, no, I'm just curious, you know, like how Jacob and even you were saying, Joel, right, before, that you guys are, to a certain extent, curious people. I am too, and and I would go to greater lengths, more than five hours, sometimes even three days, you know, sometimes even little to no sleep, to understand something. And that's a beautiful thing. At the end, you're like, oh, I know this thing. Two days, late, two days after, maybe your memory of that isn't as strong. And then that Socratic paradox comes in, right? Like, I read that thing, I understood that thing. But now there's this other element that is present that I'm trying to understand. And why can't I integrate my understanding to this new experience, right? It's because I can't. It's because it's because really, <laughs> the more you know, the less you understand. <laughs> it's a, the, the best way I can explain it to you guys. It's that. And it's like a cycle of it. You know, there's reasons why I pick up a book again. I've read this book like five times, six times. But I've picked it up again because I need to refresh. And every time you read it, every time you know something more, like everything, something new stands. Like, you know how they say about movies, right? You watch Interstellar once, you might be able to understand the general story of it. You watch Interstellar three times, four times. You look at the very minute, minute things that Nolan put in that film. You can pick that out. You can see, oh, that uh, that structure inside that event horizon, inside that black hole. Why was he seeing his daughter in that time? Why was time like laid out in a physical way? Like you really start to like understand things. And I feel like this is what I am. I love to know things. I love to understand things. I love to revisit them and get new insights from it. That's just the person I am. And I would go to greater lengths. Because I feel like that's just a personality archetype. That's just how I am, you know? Like, Joe, like, he he's a very disciplined... Like, I feel like you would be a very disciplined guy because you are you have that athletic mindset, right? And then you have, like, an entrepreneurial mind. So you have how to interact with society, how to keep the business going. Like, you know, you have that... So you our personalities are different. And and my personality puts out this, this kind of thing that I would go to greater lengths to creatively understand what is going on around me. Yeah. How old you, by the way? Uh, uh, 24. How old are you guys? We're 19. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's still in that, you know, new, uh, oh, okay, undergrad, uh, second year, first year, second uh, semester, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, last, yeah. Um, it gets crazier. Yo, it gets crazier. Like, right now, I know how you guys are, because, like, I was like you guys back in the day. And every year is going to get crazier for you guys. Like the more you go into the pursuit of knowledge and experience, it's good for you. Obviously, it's really good for you. The more you get frustrated, the more you have like all of these like things. Okay, like I know this thing, but you don't know this thing, you know, like you realize those things. Right now, I I, I just, I, I it's like I'm looking back. It's like I'm in a different galaxy and I'm looking at a telescope and I'm looking at it. It's like I can see those things. But I'm just going to wish you guys very 
the very best because it's a it's a journey. Okay. It's it's a literally a psychedelic trip. You know what's gonna happen in the next couple of years. You'll realize, by the way, when you get to like the age of 23, 24. I mean, if you if you're still athletic, I guess maybe not, but 23, 24, you start to like feel old, dude. Like I look at like, you know, you you 19, 20 year olds now, it's like I can't relate to them anymore. I, I can relate to you guys because we have the similar interests and whatever, but like the general pop the mainstream people, right? Like I can't, I can't. And you will understand that. <laughs> and it's insane when you when you grasp that, it's such a it's such a beautiful like insight. You'll you'll get there. But I wish you guys luck. And and really this was a really great conversation. I loved it. Yeah. Honestly. It, nice. it, it's yeah. Kind of, it's kind of a new fear now, like not to go mm-hmm. insane with knowledge. <laughs> no, if you listen, go deep. Go deep all you like. Just don't lose yourself. Yeah. You know? Um, I guess, you know, don't become Nietzsche yeah <laughs> it's just, just you know just putting it out just don't don't become james joyce mm. you know that's a good one you know or become that or become that and you'll have like another schizophrenic kind of understanding of reality which is unique in a way and that's why it's treasured you know but well, be ready for anything and everything that's it well um i'm, I'm gonna enjoy listening back to this once twice a lot of times because I, I like the consciousness chart especially like i was a bit out of my depth there i, I don't know how much you understood joel but yeah I, yeah I, I need to get i do that <laughs> but i would really suggest that you just this is a good book it's a good book like um minsky wrote a couple of good books this is a good book if you want to look at it if you want to look at consciousness from a ai perspective of how like putting things you know because like in business because you're like on if you're doing a business course you know how like things are more things are more objectively phrased I know. yeah so he objectively phrases the affective aspect of consciousness it's very yeah. interesting um, and and you'll have your own realizes you can make your own flow chart it's insane amazing if <laughs> i'll be my own flow chart yeah uh, <laughs> if people want to find out more about you and sort of what you do where should they go I mean, just go, I guess, Twitter or Instagram and you'll have a link, the link tree link on the page and then you can just access it, right. any, any you know, link that you want. Yeah, I'll, I'm everywhere. I'll put your stuff on the show notes. All right, okay. Um, yeah. Nice talk. How, how long did we go, by the way? Wow, I got lost. This is how you know it's a good podcast when you get lost in it, when you have no concept of time. <laughs> yeah, that was almost two hours. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Uh, it's been good to meet you right. and i'll spend you i'll send you the uh spanish medicine music album <laughs> i'm fascinated with what that medicine means and that like <laughs> the spanish and like how does that correlate to each other please do send yeah well i will cool thank you very much okay good time